Hello and welcome to an all-new weekly edition of Perspectives. I'm Deacon Pedro. Today we continue celebrating consecrated life by looking at a little-known and most ancient form of vocation. And to tell us more about it, I'm joined now by Mary Bastido. Mary, welcome. Thanks, Pedro. Consecrated virginity. What is that? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> right off the bat. That's a big question. Well, it's something I've grown into very gradually. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, where to start with my story? Like, I grew up in the 60s mm -hmm. and kind of looking for alternatives, looking for community, looking for meaningfulness. I actually left university yeah. because I wanted to get out of the ivory tower yes. and do something more relevant. And mm -hmm. I, I think I actually was drawn to be close to the poor. Okay. just to get to know real people and what they were really living. Right. So I left Toronto, went out to Vancouver, okay. and ended up working for the United Church in right. the inner city of Vancouver, which is exactly what I wanted to be doing. It was a church where people were coming for extra food and groceries yeah. and clothes. And were you a Christian? Um, I had grown <laughs> up in the United Church. Okay, so yeah, yeah. And then the 60s, everything was up for question. You know? <laughs> right. I think I would have said I was not a Christian. Right. But I was searching. Uh -huh. And then to work in that church was wonderful. Mm -hmm. It was a really good experience of team and outreach. And um, I was on a, a spiritual journey. Yeah. And I started reading the Bible. I was really asking, who is Jesus? Yes. And I think I was gradually discovering Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, and one day I read a book by Jean Vanier, uh -huh. which really spoke to my heart. Like right. he just understood the struggle of getting beyond the barriers, you know, outside of your selfish, fearful little world. And how do you really work, reach out? Right. And because he had got to know people with developmental disabilities, mm -hmm. on the strength of his word, really, mm -hmm. I decided to get to know people with disabilities. So that's when you joined LAR, uh, the LAR? Uh, not yet. No, I was okay. living in Vancouver. Okay. And I was, I started to do volunteer work, mm -hmm. like swimming once a week yes. and a little drop in on Friday nights where they wanted me to play the piano. So I did. You know, right. Like they were really calling me out of myself. Mm -hmm. And I just loved being with them. Mm -hmm. And then I found out there was a L'Arche community starting in Edmonton. So L'Arche is the community founded by Jean Vanier That's right. for people, adults. That's right, with developmental with development, disabilities. Yes. And that was the time of real expansion of L'Arche. So I went to Edmonton in 73. Okay. Yes. And wow, I just landed in this community that was essentially a Catholic community. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't Catholic, but no. it was like the gospel just came alive. Right. And, uh, and then a priest would come, and we'd have mass in this little chapel. And it was like, wow. I mean, that was the first time I ever attended a Eucharist. Right. And I was so drawn to it. And it just brought the meaningfulness, brought the peace, the joy into our community mm -hmm. again. You know, things would get so scattered and mixed up, and you'd get so exhausted. And then, oh, yeah, this is why we're here. Right. This is what it's all about. And I was meeting nuns and priests uh -huh. for the first time in my mm -hmm. life. And I must say their celibate witness really touched me. So you, okay, because I was going to ask you, yeah. did in meeting them and through their witness and because of the Eucharist, I, 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 I know that you began feeling a tug towards the Catholic Church, but did yeah. you feel a call to that religious life? Well, what I saw in these nuns and priests, uh -huh. <clears throat> The witness of celibacy, and I'd never even heard of celibacy before, no. but it was like, wow, you mean God's love is so personal and so real that you can stake your life on it, mm -hmm. like that that's enough. So there was something about yeah. that that spoke to you? It did. Like, and I'd say in the United Church growing up, it was like, you know, God created the world and God created family and uh -huh. and of a sort of God is kind of out there. Mm -hmm. But to think that God is so intimately yes. involved with us yes. and there's a personal relationship with God yes. that's so real that it's enough. So at this point in time where you start did you start thinking, I, I want to live this? Did you It was I would say, okay, three weeks after I arrived at Larche Edmonton, Jean Vanier arrived oh for goodness. the official opening. And then he took some of us on a retreat uh -huh. in Naramata, BC. It was 400 people, Beautiful. nuns, priests, families, people with disabilities. And it was like, wow. And he was talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And 
I mean, I just fell in love with Jesus. Yes. And, and then I was meeting these nuns, and, and they were there in the chapel praying, and it was like I really learned about praying mm -hmm. uh, through that retreat, and there was a little small group sharing where we prayed together, mm -hmm. and that was amazing. That sort of launched me into this journey. And what I, I, so I was drawn to celibacy, but had you know, made no kind of formal. Mm -hmm. But it just opened my heart in a different way. Like, so I was more like friends as brothers and sisters right. with people. Right. That became an option. You don't realize how much the world is so obsessed with mm -hmm. finding a mate or you yes. know, finding Mr. Right. Let me just, yeah. a little parenthesis, because we're, we're and, and this is yeah. very interesting, and we are going to get to the first question. Um, <laughs> Growing up, you you never f thought about, I mean, you weren't Catholic, so you weren't thinking about religious life. Were you no. thinking about marriage? Was that even well, something that you thought I about? I was really in the mood of the 60s, <laughs> like looking for alternatives. Okay. And I was not attracted to the life in the suburbs with a two-car garage. So that was married life. You know, that's... Yes. <laughs> Yeah. I was looking for alternatives. Mm -hmm. So no, I wasn't attracted to that. No. And even the whole issue of children, I mean, I love children, but I sort of looked out into the world and thought, there's so many people, there's so many children that need mothering, that need mm -hmm. care. And I looked at someone like Mother Teresa, there she was, bring them to me. Yes. And I, I thought, that's what I need yes. to do, more than yes. create more children. Absolutely. It was more like to be a mother on some level, I think. So then jumping ahead, going back to this, this uh, awareness that maybe there was a, a deeper calling, in, in wanting to know more, to know Jesus more, something about that celibate life spoke to you. Yes. So I would say in those years in Edmonton, I was discovering a new freedom. Not to be seeking a man, you know, mm -hmm. but to be there as brothers and sisters and deepening a life of prayer. I think those two things go together. So it was a movement of my heart. And then I left Larsh. Uh -huh. uh, after four years, and it was kind of chaotic. It was a difficult leaving. Um, and then I was searching, what would I do? So I ended up making the exercises of St. Ignatius yes. in Guelph with yes. Father John English. And out of that came a choice for a contemplative life. Right. So I did actually join a religious community for a year. You did. The Poor Clares out in British really? Columbia. And so I think I needed to try that. Uh-huh. And uh, in a way, it was a year of formation that's mm -hmm. just really helped me. Yes. But it wasn't my vocation in the end. No. And finally, the abbess just said, well, if you're not peaceful, it's not your vocation. Yes. And I was like, oh, Wise good. Words. Oh, good. <laughs> yes, good. <laughs> you know, I really tried, but it just wasn't the right fit for me. Yes. And then I went back to university and studied occupational therapy uh -huh. for three years. And then I was invited to go to L'Arche. Daybreak. Again. So yes. that's in Richmond. That's the community in Richmond Hill, Ontario. Um, so and okay. So then, at this point, you still haven't made any. That's right. Commitment to other than that one year with the poor Claires in BC. Yeah, and so uh, then I think things were more thrown up into question. I wasn't so sure about celibacy. Yes. But then coming back into Larsh, we have wonderful sort of. Um, we have a very good soil in Larsh for, yes. for reflection and yes. we have retreats yes you know so I went on this retreat two years after I had come back so it was 85 mm -hmm. with Father Bill Clark mm -hmm. and at that point I just knew I had to look at the question of celibacy more formally yes in prayer and um, at that point in my life I was 30 something and it was a more painful choice Yes. Because it was more about realizing I wouldn't have children. Uh -huh. It's one thing in your 20s to just be. But then in your 30s, it's another deeper choice. Mm -hmm. So I remember going into the chapel at that retreat, and I just knew I needed to ask the question, but it was like a knot in my stomach. Mm -hmm. you know. But it was like, do you want me to be celibate? Mm -hmm. And then I just got this peace. It was quite extraordinary. And, and, and that, that was the yes. That was the yes. Yeah. And so at that yeah. point... So, so then I went to talk to Father Bill, who okay. was my spiritual director. Yes. 
And I just told him what had happened. He said, well, that sounds good. Mm. And so we made, uh, I made a one-year commitment to live celibacy, okay. and he witnessed it. So you felt a need to formalize it, if I can use that word, to make it official, but it was still a private... Very private, yeah. ...private commitment with the advice of your, or the direction yeah. of your spiritual director. And f for a year. For a year. So it's limited, you yes. know? Yes. And I think I went into it with kind of a very little, <laughs> yes, okay, <laughs> I'll try this, the you year. know. Exactly. But what I realized, what I experienced was, I was happy. Yes. You know, there was a joy, there was an energy that was freed up in me mm -hmm. that, that kind of surprised me. Because mm -hmm. I didn't realize how much I was still kind of looking for someone. Right. But after I made this commitment, it was like, this is where I belong and this Jeez. is my fruitfulness. Yeah. And I think that was part of the step of trust, that God would make me fruitful. Right. As a celibate, as a celibate woman. woman. You know, that that is my journey. It's my way of loving. It's mm -hmm. my way of fruitfulness. Right. And you can compare it to a married woman. Yes. Who has children and who has a spouse. But this is another way. Mm -hmm. So then, after a year, I said yes again with more confidence. Okay, I was going to ask you. And then another, another year. year. Okay, now meanwhile, I had moved to Larsh in Stratford in, in the London well. Diocese, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. I was a community leader there, and I was regularly visiting Bishop John Sherlock, who was okay. the bishop, just because I was the Larsh yes. leader, and he was very supportive of Larsh. Mm -hmm. And after four years of renewing this commitment, the uh -huh. question came up, again in a Larsh retreat, Yes. well, is there a permanent commitment that you would make? Or do you just keep renewing yes. this every year? So I asked Bishop Sherlock that question, and he just lit up. He said, oh, I know just the thing. And he went and got his red sacramentary mm -hmm. and showed me this rite of consecration to a life of virginity. Okay, we're going to take a break there. Okay. Perfect, perfect <laughs> place to take a break, because when we come back, we're going to continue this, this insightful conversation, but also we're going to finally come to know exactly what this rite of consecration to permanent virginity is so don't go very far. Welcome back to Perspectives on Consecrated Life. Today we're speaking with Mary Bastido, the right of consecration to a life of permanent virginity. Yes. <laughs> a life of virginity. Yes. Okay. And it's assumed well, that it's, it's permanent. permanent. Yes. Okay. So you had been renewing for a year. You spoke to Bishop Sherlock in London, and he said, you can do this as a permanent. This is something that exists in the church. Exactly. And it's interesting because it's an ancient rite that was very popular in the early days. Well, is it the most ancient uh, form of religious life? I think so. Well, it was very popular in the fourth century, uh -huh. and you'll read some of the bishops talking about the consecrated virgins. Yes. I mean, and I sense it's this impulse from the time of Jesus. Yes. I mean, look at Mary Magdalene, for example. Mm -hmm. Just that impulse to follow Jesus with her whole yeah. life and give her all. I mean, that's at the heart of it. Absolutely. So, but the right fell into disuse as religious orders as, grew exactly. up. Because I guess practically, it, it wasn't practical for a woman to be alone as unmarried well, in, 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 that, in that society, I guess, in that yeah. world. And so the bishops yes. decided. So that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and, but then the bishops decided again exactly. in the Second Vatican Council exactly. to Which restore it. Exactly. Which was very interesting. Yes. 1970, they sort of dusted it off and renewed it and made it available again for women living yes. in the world. So right. that's the other little subtext. Women living in the world. So it's, 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 it's a celibate life it's consecrated by the church yes. but it's not living in a religious community that's right so you're not a religious sister that's right you are and i don't have any sign except for this ring a ring of consecration okay. so we don't wear a veil or a habit or anything like and that and you don't profess vows no the wording of it is slightly different like we are consecrated so but there's a whole intentionality about it like it, it's like are you resolved to follow Christ with your whole mm -hmm. heart and are you resolved to receive solemn consecration 
as a bride of Christ. So the language is very much... It is interesting because you think that, that yeah, you, that there is a vow of celibacy if it's you're committing to permanent... But it's, it's just slightly different, it's different than religious life in the nuance mm -hmm. of it. Right. Um, so then you just say yes. Yes. <laughs> and then the bishop lays his hands on you. It's actually more like an ordination in the the way the right Interesting. evolves. And it's not like with religious vows that you do temporary vows and then permanent no, vows. So it's like you have the right and that's it. Yeah. So I think, you know, the, the time that I had personally to grow into the vocation was really important. Mm -hmm. It's not something you want to jump into. No. Because it is permanent. So, uh, so uh, Bishop Sherlock gave me a copy of this and I took it home and prayed with it for a year. This was a big step. Yes. Even though I had done this annual, mm -hmm. I again was at a large event during the <laughs> summer and there was an eight-day retreat and I prayed about it and it was a struggle. Yes. Uh, I'd say with every commitment there's a death. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a, a big struggle. Uh, but in the end I realized it was my deepest desire. Mm -hmm. So uh, whereas at the beginning it was kind of God saying, yes, this is what mm -hmm. I want. The response finally was, yes, this is what I want to. Yeah, so again, that's surrendering yeah, to, to and, who you really are. Yeah, and it is kind of the shape of my heart, yeah. and it's my deepest desire to belong totally to the Lord. Yes. And it's um, a leap of faith, and I would say it's the church that's inviting me to believe. It's the church that's calling me to be the bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. That's not something I would ever assume no. on my own. I'm like, really? The bride of Christ, you know, but it's a, it's this invitation to trust, to have the courage to trust it. Yeah, and the fact that it's the church that's called, so it's an ecclesial yeah. vocation. Yeah. It's not Very you personally so. saying, "I want to consecrate myself to Jesus Christ," and and do it privately. Yeah. It's a very which, public. Yeah, which you can do, but this yes. is very public. It was a very big event in the, the parish in Stratford, yeah. and. And how different? And again, maybe this is not a fair question, but how different is that than? then joining a religious community, in essence, aren't they also being called to be Brides of Christ? I think so. Although, you know what, not every religious sister feels that way. Like, mm -hmm. I, I know that because okay. people have told me that. Yes. Like, the vocabulary, is the sort of the spirituality of yeah. it. And there's certainly the community life aspect that you didn't feel yeah. called to join. Yeah. Definitely, you didn't feel called to join a contemplative order, but even a, 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 a community a religious community, but you are part of a community yeah, because you're part of the large community. Yes. So I'm a bit of an anomaly, <laughs> but here I am being interviewed. Yeah. But so I came back to Toronto, this, this archdiocese, yes. in 93. And so at the time, Bishop Clune talked to me and he knew I was a consecrated virgin mm -hmm. and he said, would you help me just in talking to women if they're yes. interested? Yes. I, he said, they don't want to talk to me. They want to talk to someone of who's course. living it. So since then, I've been uh, accompanying and helping mm -hmm. women to With discern in this diocese. Would you call that that is? Would you call it formation? Yeah. Uh, formation slash dis discernment. Discernment. Um, so obviously, there were other women who were feeling the same tug in wherever they were, however, what a state of life they were in, feeling that same tug, and approaching the church because yeah. the bishop knew. Uh, there are a few. Yes, okay. And, and you know what? It's never going to be a lot of people. Okay. Uh, but I think it's like there's a real value of being a sign. Mm -hmm. uh, and people can consecrate their lives to God in so many different ways. Uh -huh. And we're not saying this is better or anything, mm -hmm. but it's just this one sign that's really held by the church and valued by the church. But I think it's important that uh, it's this witness of the eschatology. Eschatology, yeah. yes, yes, that's a big um, word that means, th th you mean, so, okay, so you mean that the sign to that marriage, that nuptial union that we're all called to in heaven, in heaven with Jesus Christ, we're all called to that. You're a sign in this life to that life that we're all, to that union that we're all called to. Yeah. Is that what you mean? It, it is, and I think, um, you know, I think marriage and celibacy are really mutually complementary. Yes. So I think it helps married people to see celibate people mm -hmm. and and vice versa like married people inspire me and hopefully I can be an inspiration to you that like your wife isn't everything to you there's more like your heart is given to God mm -hmm. it's not just 
the relationship with your spouse. You know what I mean? There's yes, I do. And do you, and and you don't feel that you're giving something up. I mean, you said that your heart is shaped. Well, I am giving something up, but <laughs> it's still my deepest desire. Yes. But there's a sacrifice in it mm -hmm. as well. But the same with you. It you're is not. The same you marry one life. woman, you can't marry all the rest. Yes. You know, so there's an element of. I can't. S sacrifice <laughs> to that, Pedro. <laughs> anyway, um, but I, th I think especially today when our culture is so suspect, mm -hmm. it doesn't trust celibacy. Yes. yes. You know, and if you're a priest, for example, it kind of comes with the package. Yes. It's, and uh, even in religious life, it's poverty, chastity, and obedience. Yes. But with this particular vocation, it's just about chastity. Yes. So it, it's a witness that God really is giving that gift mm -hmm. to the church today. Right. And the fact that you're living in the world, I mean, the fact that you're in the large community is, is, is your situation, but that's not the situation with other women yeah. who are consecrated. Um, they because might they have, can work. They, that's right. Yeah. They have a different mission. Yes. Um, but Larsh is really the soil for me that keeps yes. me anchored, and it's very ecumenical. So yeah. I'm glad to, that I'm sort of anchored in the Catholic Church and then freed to be part of this ecumenical community. So the work, uh, the, the, the help or the guidance that you give some of the other women, or the women who are discerning, uh, you're just helping them through the journey, helping them discern what, mm -hmm. I guess, I guess the real question is, if, if there was someone watching right now yes. who's thinking, oh, I didn't know this existed, yes. this, is, this, is what I've, yeah. this is where my heart is shaped, what advice would you give so, them? So, I work with Bishop Boissonneau. Okay, He's in the Archdiocese of, of Toronto. Toronto. Yes. So, he'd be the one to contact, and you would meet him. So, they would him. contact the bishop directly. Yeah, and then after you meet him, then he would say, I think this is a suitable candidate, so would you walk with this person for a year or two? Okay. That would be typical. So a year or two would be typical discernment? Yes. And then... And formation. There's things to read and, and reflect then what on. Happen? And, and then, then you would be consecrated. After two years? Uh, oh, there's not, okay. No, it's not yes. written in stone. It's just when the time is right. Yes. Yeah. And... So that has happened. There's, you know, there's six or eight people that I've been walking with. In, this, in the Archdiocese yeah. of Toronto, and there's six or eight group. people. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I say six or eight. Some of them left. No, okay, yeah. and and how many are consecrated in the Archdiocese of Toronto right now? Yeah, it's about ten or so. Like, oh, there's really? a few that I haven't met, but their names are on the list. Yes, and now just to go back to being a sign, are some of is it different for everyone? Are some of them sort of like undercover? I mean, they're not publicly. That's right. It's quite hidden. It is hidden. Yeah. That's why you don't so, know about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're doing this program. How, so then how is it a sign? I, get, I mean, I, I know what you mean yeah, by it being yeah. a sign, but in terms of it being a, a, a physical witness to the world, that, that might not be the case, depending on yeah. your, your, so, your situation. I think people that know me, I think I'm a sign on a more yes. informal level. But you're asking good questions. Like that, it's kind of a, I, I'm not sure, it, it is a bit of a paradox there. Mm -hmm. And I think it is new and we're growing into it. Right, <coughs> right, okay. Maybe this is a good place to end. <laughs> good questions, not always answers, but I guess that's part of our, our journey as we, as we get closer to, to Christ, which is, which is the journey that we're all on. Um, and you're, you're a sign mm. <laughs> of the journey that we need to get, okay. get, get on board. Is Thanks, that fair Pedro. to say? Yeah, it's Thank, been good to talk about it. Thank you, Mary, for your witness. Mm. You're welcome. We've been speaking about consecrated virginity with Mary Bastido. Um, you've heard her. Now it's time to hear from you. Perhaps you have an experience uh, with the right of consecration to the permanent life of virginity, if we can call it that, or as consecrated virgins, or, or you've had that tug in your heart, write to us, tell us your story. You can reach us through Facebook, facebook.com slash TV, or via Twitter, at TV. That's all for tonight. May God continue to bless you and your home.